Hey everybody and welcome to the show. This is Lewis Lautman and you are about to be inspired and energized to take your business and your life to the next level. We are providing training that makes a difference in the lives of millions all around the world through our seminars, coaching programs, and video trainings just like this one. But before we get started with today's interview, we want to have a word from our sponsor. Supreme Outsourcing is an outsourcing company that wants you to delegate the work that you don't want to do, don't know how to do, or quite frankly, don't feel that it's worth your time. They want to do that work for you. If you're ready for more freedom, if you want to reduce your expenses, and you'd like to increase your revenues, give Supreme Outsourcing a call or send them an email or go ahead to their website and contact them. They do anything that can be done online or on the telephone. Anything from building a website to designing your graphics to your social media management to making outbound sales calls or appointment setting calls to taking inbound calls or customer service calls, doing data research, data entry, your bookkeeping, you name it. Supreme Outsourcing is the supreme choice in delegating your tasks to. If you want to become a lifestyle master, you need to start delegating more. And if you know me, you know that I say a master of lifestyle is one whose best friends don't know the difference between their work and their play. So this is Lewis Lautman and get ready for today's training. All right, welcome back everybody. This is Lewis Lawman. I am so excited to have a very special guest here with us today. He's a man that you probably saw from the Yes Movie. If you haven't seen the Yes Movie, you're going to have to go out and watch it. It's at theyesmovie.com. This is a man that they call the toilet paper entrepreneur. I don't know where that started or where it came from. That's his first book, The Toilet Paper Entrepreneur. But I'm really excited to talk to you about this book. I'll show it to you in a minute. We'll get more into that, but let me welcome a man who's been helping entrepreneurs for many, many years all around the world build amazing businesses. And what I'm so excited about, he was talking about firing some of your clients in his new book, which I can't wait to get into. This is Mr. Mike McCallowitz. How you doing, Mike? Louis, I am doing great. Thank you for that awesome introduction. And hi, everyone. Welcome to our little talk session. I hope you're going to learn a lot here. Absolutely. So you just came out with the book. It is called The Pumpkin Plan. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so that one, I'll give you, start giving you the longer story. Just give me the kill signal if I'm going too long. But basically, when I started my first company, Lewis, I was just struggling like the son of a bitch. I, I couldn't make it. it was, I was in the work harder syndrome. You know, the only way to make money is work harder. And I heard the business code. And what it boiled down to, he said a few things, the 5% of things. And then started saying all these things I need to change. And it became overwhelming again. Well, at the same time, I happened to be reading the local newspaper, and I was flipping through it, and on there had an article about a pumpkin farm that had grown a colossal pumpkin. And what caught my attention, the interviewer, the journalist, said, how do you do it? And his first response was, oh, I only do 5% of my things differently. And I was like, hold on, my business coach said change 5%. This pumpkin farmer changed 5%. And he was able to grow a pumpkin, not like the average 10-pound pumpkin that you buy at Halloween, but like this one-ton pumpkin. <laughs> so I then started really studying the method of growing colossal pumpkins and how it parlays into growing a colossal business. I worked with my coach hand-in-hand. Hand. It took a few years, but I got the system down. The business took off. I, got, I started a second company, Computer Crime Investigation. That one, I pumpkin planned from day one. It grew explosively. And now I'm doing it in... In writing books, I'm using the pumpkin plan method and being an author and spreading the word. Yeah, and you're helping other people pumpkin plan their businesses. Just to give everybody a little bit of background, I know you mentioned it in the pumpkin plan. You mentioned it in the toilet paper entrepreneur. And by the way, if you haven't even heard of the toilet paper entrepreneur, that's Mike's first book that you will want to go out and get. And then you're going to want to read the pumpkin plan. But first, uh, you built two very, very successful companies. Can you tell us just a little bit of background about those? and? Uh, people like to hear that you kind of sold those for a little bit of cash? Yes, but my first business I started, I was 24 years old. I started a business doing computer network integration, which is like ah, boring, you know, boring. But that's what I was doing. I was the guy that, Lewis, I would come to your office and you'd say, my computer's broke. I'd say, no problem. I would charge you $500 and I'd actually make it worse. Like, that's the guy, you know? And 
uh, that company uh, I started and it was struggling, struggling, struggling until I kind of discovered this pumpkin plan. And it turned, it went to, into the millions to sell to private equity. My second company was, uh, the term's called data forensics, but it's computer crime investigation. And within the first year, by positioning the company properly, we were able to get the Enron trial. We were the major investigative arm for the defense side on the Enron trial. You know, where was all the, this stuff going? How were they laundering money and, and, and uh, how were they misrepresenting themselves to investors? We did that investigation. My company on that one case alone made a lot of money and it brought us to the, a national exposure immediately. I sold it under, I think it was about two and a half years after starting it, I sold it to a Fortune 500. Um, so that's one of my two companies. And then I decided I'm going to start writing about this stuff. And that's when I started becoming an author and write, wrote these two books. Yeah, and you've got two great bestsellers here. And a lot of you might have seen Mike on CNBC. He's always appearing on television, different shows and interviews, and uh, absolutely an authority on business and helping businesses grow. You know, when I was reading The Pumpkin Plan, um, three things stood out for me. There was quite a bit that stood out for me, other than you saying that penis pills don't work and you wouldn't take your wife on a deserted island if you were stuck there. But the three <laughs> main things that stood out for me was, uh, the first is, finding your sweet spot or finding your niche, firing your clients, which most people would think, why would you fire your clients? You're gonna fire the people that are paying you money? Right. And then raise your prices. And I absolutely love that. Those were really the three things amongst many that stood out for me. Can you touch on those a little bit? Oh yeah, I love to. The sweet spot is the area in your business where you have the most potential to excel. And it's actually an overlap of three things. Most people know the first part, some know the second, and no one knows the third, it seems. At least doesn't execute. The, the first part is what are you passionate about? You know, what makes you come alive at night, at, at day or night? And basically, a lot of people go into business and they don't pursue their passion, they pursue a get rich opportunity. Oh, I can make money doing this. Or they pursue a hobby, something that they have interest in but isn't a passion. It's how to distinguish a hobby and a passion. A hobby, while gives you satisfaction, it drains energy. A passion gives you satisfaction, but increases energy. What I mean by this is at the end of the day, Lewis, when you go to bed, if you are exhilarated, I'm, you may be physically exhausted, but your mind is exhilarated, you're tapping into your passion. If you're physically exhausted and your mind is drained, it's often that you're tapping into a hobby. So the first part of the sweet spot is is it a passion? But that alone, you know, you could be passionate about exposing yourself, which I know you might actually be. But if you're passionate about exposing yourself, like no one else really wants to see that, it doesn't work. So the second element of the sweet spot, you overlap it kind of like the Olympic symbols. You take your passion and overlap it with customer demand. So what you love to do is it's something where there's repeatable customer demand. And that you can only identify by doing it. But once you have a business going, the key question to ask yourself is, do I have customers coming back to me repeatedly? Because if they buy from you repeatedly, they're demonstrating they have a love for you. They, they want it. Now, those two components alone are not the sweet spot. It is a sustainable business but because it's your passion and people want it. Often, entrepreneurs get trapped there by doing the work themselves. The third piece that you need to bring in is scalability or systemization. What I mean by this is a business is only a scalable, successful business if you can generate a prospect, convert them to a client, extract the revenue, deliver the servicing product, have them ecstatic and happy about it, and referring you to other people all while you're sleeping. If you can do that whole set while you sleep, now you have a scalable business. So that's what the sweet spot is, the intersection of those three components. The second thing about firing our clients I know, and you probably know this too, Lewis, so many entrepreneurs that are just working harder and harder just trying to make a dime, anything that would make a dime. And what the, the trap they fall into is the next person that knocks on their door and says, hey, uh, you know, I have an opportunity for you, that entrepreneur jumps on it because it's a revenue opportunity. I need to make money. But the entrepreneur starts taking on work that's not suited for them. It's not in their field of passion. Or they take on a client that's a real Jack hole, you know the guy's a total freaking turd, and we're taking him on as a as a client because we need the money. The problem with those sucky ass clients, Lewis, is we spend 
typically an inordinate amount of time in trying to service this client. It's not something that we specialize in, so we kind of have to do a one-off customization. They don't ever feel satisfied. They ask for more and more and more and pay us less and less. And we're basically whoring ourselves out to our worst clients. If you have the courage, and I'm telling you the only way to grow a business is to have this courage, to fire that worst client, get rid of them, you now free up a tremendous amount of space emotionally, but also time-wise to dedicate to your top clients. And these successful businesses know that the success is in servicing your top clients and finding clients identical to them. If that was my dog there. If you can, if you can duplicate your top clients, meaning if you took your, your number one client, Lewis, and now made 10 of him or her, now you made 100, your business would grow explosively. And that, quite frankly, is what we need to do. We need to look for our top client and duplicate them. The only way to get there is by firing your worst clients. Yeah, and that, that, was a, that was a really huge distinction that, that stood out for me you know, in the pumpkin plan. And you actually gave an example how you did that, I think, was it with hedge funds in your book? Uh, do you want to give it a, a real life example how you did that so someone can, can get an idea? Yeah, yeah, so with my first company, I was, I was the, the classic, you know, people say, what do you do? I say, I serve all small and medium sized businesses. <laughs> it's the most generic response, and I believed it, and companies do this. Well, then I found out my sweet spot in the industry was in the hedge fund industry. But then I looked at all my other clients. I had a supermarket. I was doing their computers. I had the guy that was a, a, a lawn you know, mowing. Service and contract. I was all over the place. When I decided I only want to serve hedge funds, I learned from them that no one else knew. I really got intimate with what a hedge fund has, and then I fired the other clients. The best way, and this was the third thing you asked about, the best way the best way to fire clients and actually to gain clients is by raising prices. I went to all my clients and said, prices are going up. My worst clients said, I can't afford that, and they left, which was a blessing. My best clients actually said to me, finally, that you're dictating a premium of what you're worth. And ironically, as it came to attracting new clients, because I had a higher price point, they automatically said, oh, he's got to be the best. You know, instead of charging, like my competition at the time was charging $75 an hour, I would charge 70 just to beat him. I said, screw it. I'm going to charge 250 an hour. And now top clients were coming to me saying, wow, 250 an hour. You must be the world's best. It put them in a position to basically have a prejudice in my favor because they saw a high rate. They assumed I was high end. So the, the answer, ironically, is raise your prices. It gets rid of the crappy people and actually encourages the best clients to stay with you. And now you're act, and, and with that, you're actually working with people that can pay you now, and they're used to paying that, and they, they want the best, and you can become the best then. Yeah, and it, 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 it starts a great upward spiral. I have people that want to work with me. I have people that, have, uh, that are paying premiums, so they actually want me to succeed, so they help me because they, they're making a big investment. Uh, and it, it's more efficient. It takes way less time at a higher, higher dollar cost point. And, and the great thing, everyone should do this. I call it the client assessment. Take your list of all your clients, the number one client you have down to the El Crapola client. Write down how much revenue you make from them and how much you like them. Then figure out how many hours do you work on that particular client to make that money. So say, just for round number sakes, the top client, say you make $1,000, uh, you made $1,000 from them. And tell, say it took maybe two hours to deliver the service or product to that client. Well, now you've netted $500 an hour. Now, you look at your worst client and say you made from them $100. And it took you 10 hours to do that work. Well, for the worst client, you're only making 10 bucks an hour. Top client generates $500 an hour. Worst client makes 10 bucks an hour. That worst client, you get paid more if you worked at McDonald's. So... The lesson here is if you sort your clients, you start cutting off the bad ones, and you really cater to the best. Now, you make it seem so simple, Mike. And when I was reading The Pumpkin Plan, I think I was sharing this with you. You know, I, I truly see this as, like, almost up there. Not almost, but really up there with, like, an e-myth. How Michael Gerber talks about, you know, most people get in business. They're doing the work themselves. And then it's like, okay, it's time to step back and get other people to do that. And then become a business owner and then become the entrepreneur, and then really uh, manage the people and the systems that are running your business. And you actually make uh, that great distinction in your book, and you've got a great definition of an entrepreneur in the book, and maybe you want to uh, mention what that is. Um, and you also say the difference between an entrepreneur and a small business owner. So maybe you can talk yeah, yeah. a little bit about that and what that is. Sure. 
Well, well you, dude, I got to tell you, Lewis, the fact that you compare it to Emith just lights me up. Emith is one of the most classic entrepreneurial books. It is maybe the classic entrepreneurial book of all time. It's up there with Think and Grow Rich, in my opinion. And my objective was to write the book that was the perfect complement to Emith. I think what Michael Gerber did was amazing. He told us the message of do not work in the business, work on the business. And when I wrote the pumpkin plan, I said, okay, we know what we need to do. The question is how to do it. So I'm going to write the pumpkin plan and say how to work on the business, not in the business. And I start the book by saying the definition of an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is someone that develops a business where other people and other things are doing the execution or actually creating it. Now let, 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 I wanna, let me let me stop you there because when I read that I like I was like wow I, I was salivating when I read your definition of an entrepreneur I mean it, it was good can you just repeat what it is and then explain oh, that one people, more time you yeah, for and explain second. what that means yeah so what that means is if you're dated maybe it's a good way of doing it everyone watching right now Lewis should try to make this commitment for the next week. Have a piece of paper next to you and just write down what you're doing on a daily basis. Most of us, most entrepreneurs are answering support calls, helping key clients, selling to the client, and then you know, 2 o'clock in the morning with our eyes bleeding, we're actually doing the work we need to get done. That's what most entrepreneurs are doing. I hate this, but if that's what you're doing, you're not an entrepreneur. You're just an employee. You're a glorified employee. You haven't owned the business, but you're a glorified employee. An entrepreneur develops the system, the method for doing that work. So someone else at 2 in the morning or somebody else is sitting there at the bloody eyes, but they're following your recipe. It's kind of, if we're talking about the recipe analogy, you're the one who writes the cookbook. You're not the chef in the kitchen. The chef in the kitchen is an employee. The person that writes the recipe book, the cookbook, and hands it over, that's the entrepreneur because that cookbook can go out now to thousands of chefs out there. That's what we need to do, write the cookbook. Yeah, and, and do you find that, I mean, we probably both know the answer to this. Most people, as Michael Gerber says, get into business because they have that technical skill and they just provide that skill and that's what they do. Yeah, of course, that's why people go into it. But I'm gonna take it one step further. I'm gonna say most people have to go in business that way. I think it's a necessary first phase. Because when you start a business, everything we suppose is gonna happen rarely does. Oh, like when you made that movie, and when I wrote my first book, I think we walked a similar path. You think it's a great product we're making. We're gonna sell millions of copies. People are gonna come stampeding down our door. And then we try to sell, I try to sell my first book. It's like, people are like, that's the dumbest title in the world. F you, I'm never buying it. And it's like, oh my God. Well, what that points to is what we expect to happen rarely does. What does happen then is we find that there's another niche or another category that may resonate with. So just taking my own example of my own book, when I wrote that, I wrote it for college students. And it was a flop in the college market. But female entrepreneurs, particularly women that were in their 30s to 50s, uh, had children and so forth, were resonating with the book. I had to adopt or adapt to that new market. So in the early stage of a business, if we built a system all around selling to colleges and I was wrong, I'd be fucked. I mean, I'd be ripped and destroyed because I'd be telling other people and other things to do something that doesn't work in the first place. So Michael Gerber's right. There's technicians versus entrepreneurs. I simply argue you actually need to go through that technician phase to find out what you're really good at and what your sweet spot is. Once you know that sweet spot, that's where you must make this conversion to being an entrepreneur and doing it. And that's where most people struggle. Most people call themselves entrepreneurs. They're really technicians. They're really doing and doing and doing it. And they can't make that flip of the switch to being a true entrepreneur. Yeah. So, so you know, guys like you and I, we can talk about it. We're doing it. But how about that person who has, like, a real technical skill? They're a graphic designer. Or they're a handyman. And all they know their whole life is being handymen. And that's what their father did, and that's what they do. But they realize that they're not scaling their business. They're not actually building a business. They have, as you said, a... A glorified job. What would you suggest for right. that person who's just kind of used to doing that task, but now becoming that entrepreneur? Well, I, I, I think whatever you you do more of, and if you suck at it, you outsource it if you can. Now, in the entrepreneurial capacity, if you suck at selling, for example, you're going to need to outsource the selling. That's a very difficult thing. Uh, 
to outsource selling because I'll tell you, I've never found someone more passionate about what they do than the entrepreneur themselves. You know, when it comes to your movie, your movie's awesome, by the way. And if anyone hasn't seen Lewis's movie, the S yes movie, you're an idiot. You got to the movie. It, it's a freaking awesome, awesome movie. And I would argue for that movie, Lewis, the best salesperson ever for it was you because you believed it so much. Well, the same is true for Uber Nerd. You know, all I can do is program. I can program better than anyone else. You believe in that program so much, ultimately, you probably are the best salesperson for it because you believe in it. You may not have the charisma. You may not have the swagger as you walk into a meeting, but you believe in it the most. But here, here's the point. Whatever you do as an individual, grow that. Whatever you're strong at, do the most of it. Recognize ultimately the first thing you're going to need to delegate is the weakest spots. But as the owner, you're going to need to observe it and systemize it. So try to delegate the sales, but you need to keep a hawkeye on it and develop the system until you figure it out. Then you remove yourself from that and the system, the sales system runs on its own. Maybe the next big challenge is the big next bottleneck is the accounting. Now you focus on that and build a system. Keep pushing yourself to your super strength, but as an entrepreneur, make sure you're the one in developing the system around the other processes where you're weak. Yeah, and what's interesting about that is not only does that help you grow your business, scale your business, focus on your core competencies and figure out what matters most to you and get rid of the stuff that drains your energy, but it's also the funnest thing to do in a business, isn't it? Oh yeah, the most, yeah. <laughs> Wherever you have the most fun, you'll do the best. Here's the danger though. If I hated sales, which I love by the way, but if I hated sales, Lewis, and I was high, the typical thing entrepreneurs do is say, well, I'm just going to hire a rainmaker. I just need this guy to come in with all the swag here and do the selling for me. And I don't, I'm not going to tell him anything. He knows how to do it. That mistake. Now you people with their own belief system, their own way of doing things, and you're mixing gears that are spinning at different speed. It shreds the company apart. When you bring in that salesperson, you better already have a sales system in place. And if you don't, you have to work hand in hand with this person to understand the sales system and make sure you control it and it's executed your way. That way, the next time a salesperson comes in, they follow your system. And the next they follow your system, and now you have something that can grow. I'm a big proponent for hiring in inexperienced people, but people that have the attitude, energy, intelligence. I don't believe in bringing in the big time rainmaker, these gurus that we're going to do it their own way. I think it's going to hurt your company more than anything. Yeah, yeah, that brings up a good point. In the book, The Pumpkin Plan, you have a really I'm cool. Just put it up there, dude. Yeah. Every time I did you do that, I get a little sexually excited. There it is. <laughs> One of the best parts about The Pumpkin Plan is if you haven't seen this, there is a testimonial from Ursula McCallowitz. <laughs> what does it say there? He's a very handsome young man. So if that doesn't sell it to you, I don't know what does, guys. Uh, but you talk about in the book, you say uh, who versus how. You make a good distinction between who versus how. Who to hire or how to get something done. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, there's, there's two components, the who versus how. A lot of people, when I have, the, when I have a, a challenge or something I need to delegate, I have some work coming in, the first thing a lot of entrepreneurs think about is how am I going to do this? How am I going to get more on my plate? That's the time when you flip and you should say, who should be doing this? Who can I delegate it to? But now, you got to flip the other way. Before I delegate it to this person, do I have a system in place for them to do it? Or am I just giving them random tasks? If they don't have a how for that who, that's, that's a problem. So the proper sequence is when you have something you have to do, like, oh my God, I got a proposal done tonight. The first question is, who can I have do that? And a who sometimes is, is an automated system. Sometimes the who is my laptop automatically doing it. But who can I have doing this proposal? And then I say, how are they going to do it? What system have I developed? If I don't have a system in place, i got to spend the time doing it. And this, I recognize, is a laborious task. I could write a proposal in certain circumstances in 10 minutes. I, you know, just boilerplate, copy, paste, it's done. But if I, I don't have a system for it, it may take me maybe 10 hours to develop a system. But if I spend the 10 hours to make a system, the next time a proposal comes in, those 10 minutes I'd spend, someone else does it, it comes out perfect. Then the next time someone comes in, someone else does it, it comes perfect. Next proposal, someone else does it, it's perfect. Over time, I've made up for that 10 hours a million times over. So 
when next time you have something, think who should do it and how are they going to do it. And if they don't know, if you don't know how they're going to do it, you have to develop that system for them. So who, then how, but first have the system. If not, you create the system for them. And I think that's so valuable. I mean, that's one of the uh, things that put me with this new company, Supreme Outsourcing in the business, is that we as business owners, we only have so many hours in a day and we have to focus on these high level things. And once we start creating these systems and having these processes, we can start to identify who should be doing this. Not necessarily me. I can do it, but it doesn't mean I have to do it or should be doing it, quite frankly, because I should be, as you said, selling or growing the business or creating new channels of distribution and new processes and, and that sort of thing. Uh, one of the things that I love, and you mentioned this uh, in the Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, I remember you kind of have your, your three values of who you do business with or your, your three core things of... Uh, you know, give the give, no dicks and, and blood money. So uh, you yeah. talked about it in, in the, the uh, pumpkin plan. You want to talk a little bit about that just so people kind of get an idea of who you are and, and who you do business hey, with? Hey, sure. It, it is important. So I, I call them immutable laws, but quite frankly, core values and immutable laws are exchangeable. I just came up with my own term just to sound, sound, sound fancy schmancy. But I actually have four of them. One is no dicks allowed, one is blood money, one's positivity or death, and the other one's gift to give. And these are values I've defined for myself in my life and have brought them from my subconscious level to a conscious level. We, we all have values. We all have certain rules, immutable laws that we follow by. You know, I suspect, Louis, you wouldn't go out and kill someone. You would beat yourself up over that forever, and then you'd probably go to jail. But you would never do it. Just, I don't kill anyone. But... Same regard, if someone's attacking your family, I suspect killing someone wouldn't be beyond you if it's that big of a threat. Those are immutable laws, guidelines that we assign to ourselves to justify a behavior. And we know we're in breach of one of our immutable laws when we start kicking ourselves, saying, why did I do that? That's not me. And we also know we're consistent with our immutable laws, and we're like, yeah, that's me, baby, that's me. Those are immutable laws. What we need to do as business owners is make them from a subconscious kind of feeling to an actual conscious thought. And that's why I wrote them down. For example, no dicks allowed. I hate dealing with people that are told <laughs> douchebags, douchebags, toolboxes. Like I, it's, I don't care if you're going to pay me a million dollars. If you're going to be a dick, I don't want to do business with you because a million dollars isn't even worth it. Additionally, I will not permit myself to ever be a dick to anyone. I'm not going to take advantage of someone. I'm not going to be a douche. I'm just going to be the real me and really be genuine. That's what I call a no-dick rule. So that rule, now that it's at a conscious level, it applies to my business. When we consider clients, we have a new prospect calling, uh, wanting to do work with us. One of the filters, we don't say, hey, dude, are you a dick or not? But one of the filters, as we're interviewing this person to talk to them, we're playing out the rules. Is this person a dick or not? If they are a dick, not going to do business with them. If they are, we will. And these filters apply to all facets of my business. My website, when I designed my website, I said, does this kind of come across as like this ostentatious dick? Because if it does, ain't me. Or does it come across as a no dick website? And then when I says yes, it's a no dick website, it gets rolled out. So immutable laws are the rules or the guidelines you develop your entire business around. That's what those are. And those Beautiful. Are. By the way, you want to give us your website. We'll have the Amazon link below the video right here to purchase a copy of The Pumpkin Plan. And you'll probably want to subscribe to Mike's blog. What, what's the blog, Mike? Yeah, so my blog, I moved it over to MikeCallowitz.com. I recognize that name's the hardest name in the world to spell. Just give your best shot at Mike McCallowitz. Google will find it. And uh, really cool blog post. I got a real sexy one coming up in the next couple of weeks to... So check it out. Yeah, Mike, one of the things I love about uh, your blog is your, your emails that you send out. I mean, you basically write like you talk. It's kind of like you're hanging out with an old buddy, you know, just reading emails and reading his posts. So when, when you get Mike, you get Mike. So if you really resonate with Mike, I highly recommend you check out below and you'll see you can subscribe to his blog in addition to picking up a copy of The Pumpkin Plan here. Um, so tell us, you know, I got the analogy, obviously. Some people might be thinking, wow, this guy came out with a toilet paper entrepreneur. Now it's the pumpkin plan. I'm not a farmer. You know, what's this all about? Right. Uh, I get the analogy, obviously. But tell the folks who are watching this, how did you come up with the name The Pumpkin Plan? And why is it so relevant to what the book is about? Yes. Yeah, so, so The Pumpkin Plan, I was telling a story earlier. I was flipping through the newspaper. This goes back a decade ago. And I learned about this guy growing colossal pumpkin. And the fascinating part was... He changed the growing behavior by 5%. He, 
He, the way he selected seeds was a little different. The way he watered the plant was a little different. Not tremendously different, a little bit different. The way he evaluated the health of the plant, the way he went about pruning, just a little bit different. And the pumpkin responded with explosive growth. And what I thought fascinating first was that it was only a 5% change and it happened. But the other thing is, a pumpkin is a natural organism. It's, it's out of nature. It wasn't designed necessarily to be colossal, but if you change a few things, it responds with this explosive growth. And that's what I was thinking. I was like, well, a business is a natural organism. It's made of people at the end of the day. If we just change how we treat that natural organism of a business a little differently, it can respond with explosive growth. And that's where I saw this analogy. The steps that the pumpkin farmer follows, it's uncanny, is the same steps that an entrepreneur follows in the pumpkin, the business responds with explosive growth. So that's where the analogy came from. Do you have anything planned for Halloween this year? I mean, is that going to be a, a big date for you? Is there a big business? Yeah, event? you know, a lot of people, it's so funny. So a lot of people say, dude, Halloween's going to be huge for you. No, I'm not doing anything for Halloween. Um, a lot of people think, you know, anytime someone wipes their ass with toilet paper, that I'm going to gain tons of business. No, I'm not. <laughs> I just use it as common analogies. Everyone, when it comes to toilet paper entrepreneur, everyone's been in that situation where you run out of toilet paper and you're like, what the hell do I do? And that's where that analogy came from. Yeah. Everyone, at least in the marriage, when Halloween comes, goes shopping for pumpkins. And we all have been in that pumpkin field looking for the perfect pumpkin. You find that like really ugly one that looks like your mother-in-law or something. You're like, oh, Like, we've all been there. And that's where I came up with these analogies. And what better gift to give somebody on Halloween than the pumpkin plan? There you hey. go. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, what I really liked as well, I was thinking about, and I, I kind of visualized this, I'm thinking of the pumpkin patch, and I'm thinking about the gentleman who you're talking about, who's uh, the farmer of the pumpkin patch, and it said that he snipped off all of the other, you know, decrepitated and small and cancerous, you know, little pumpkins. And, you know, I just want to set that analogy for people where, if you do look to nature, if you do look to how, as you said, organisms grow, similar to that of a business, why that's so important, uh, and that particular analogy of cutting off, and that's almost like cutting off the bad clients or cutting off uh, uh, the things that you shouldn't be doing in your business, I suspect. Yeah, you, dude, you so have it on, on, on target. When it comes to a pumpkin, uh, pumpkins grow on vines. Dims off one vine will start growing. The colossal pumpkin farmer looks for the one that has the most potential. And by the way, this is already different than most farmers. Most farmers look for any plant that's growing and tries to encourage them all along. The ordinary pumpkin farmer is in the quantity game. Just grow anything. Well, the ordinary entrepreneur is in the same mindset. It's like, I don't care what happens. I just need money. Do anything. The extraordinary pumpkin farmer looks for the one that has the most strength and commits to that one. Something that has the most potential, he commits all his efforts into growing it. And the first step is kill the weak ones. So any weak pumpkins that start sprouting, he cuts it off because he knows the nutrients, the water is being redirected away from that strong one to support the weak ones. Well, what I found is with extraordinary entrepreneurs, and, and I had the same experience in my own businesses, we have to cut away the weak stuff so that the strong stuff can grow. The most common distraction or weak pumpkin, if you will, is labeled as opportunity. Right, so you'll talk to a new, uh, you'll talk to an entrepreneur and say, "Oh, I got this new opportunity. Ooh, I'm gonna pursue this opportunity." Every time they do that, they're facing the weak pumpkin, and that one that potentially is going strong, the nutrients are being pulled away again, and it doesn't grow. I found that the most successful entrepreneurs have the discipline to say no to new opportunities way more than they ever say yes, where struggling entrepreneurs say yes way more than they ever say no. That's the big difference. Wow, and that allows them to give the nutrients to that main one opportunity that they're, or client or whatever it is that they're focusing on. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah. And I remember in the book you mentioned uh, something, and this is a big difference, I think. It really stood out for me as a big wow, was the difference between good pain and bad pain. Good pain and bad pain? Yeah. Yeah, you kind of cut out there. Yeah, good pain. Yeah, but, no. You know, let me let me just share with you. This was my initial, <laughs> this is where I took my notes. It was, uh, uh, as I was reading it in the airplane, I think I was on my way here to, to Columbia. I ripped out a piece from a magazine. The only thing I could find was... Dude, awesome. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> the white love... paper. This is going to go in the Smithsonian one day of the original notes of the pumpkin plan. <laughs> so you know, from here, because my connection, the visual is kind of bad. It looks like you have a dragon tooth in your hand. Or yeah, something. It, like this is literally tooth. where I took my notes about the pumpkin plan. <laughs> yeah, 
it's good pain versus bad pain. You know, the analogy goes back to working out. Um, there's good pain and bad pain, right? When you lift weights uh, and you do it properly, you get what's called a burning sensation. That's a, a good pain. It means you're developing. Conversely, if you overdo it and you, you tear your shoulder, you tear a muscle, you experience a bad pain. Something that's showing damage. Well, the same is true in business. Struggling, there's two types of struggling, right? There's struggling that's taking you in a bad direction, and there's struggling that's actually causing momentum. It's building strength. So you have to distinguish the two. Here's the basic method. At the end of every quarter, so every 90 days, Lewis, you sit down, you look at your business, and you write two lists. One list of what has worked for me in the last 90 days. It may have been painful. You may have struggled, but it's actually brought results. The second list is what has not worked for me. It may have been, it probably has been painful, and it hasn't yielded any benefit. Your job then is to do more of what's working and expand it, and then decrease what's not working. So every third, every 90 days, sit down, exploit and build what's working, and stop doing what's not working, or repackage it so it starts working again. That's the difference of the two types of pain. So what, what, what's an example specifically of like good pain that helps the business grow? Yeah, so good pain is system development. It's a, it's a classic one. So here's one example out of my own business. One thing that's very important to authors, and being an author is a business too, I have a product. It's called a book, and i got to sell it. It's an informational product, but it's a physical product. Well, one thing that substantiates and gets sales momentum is reviews. And if you go onto Amazon right now, a toilet paper entrepreneur has roughly 400 reviews. For a book, that's a, a significant amount of reviews. It brings credibility to it. It's more likely people will buy a book with more reviews. Well, reviews don't happen automatically. Some people go out and do reviews, but you can also facilitate that. I had to develop a system for it. And they have to be real reviews. I don't manufacture reviews. I need to find people that have read my book, then ask them, hey, would you be willing to do an honest review, and then encourage them to actually do it. Many people say, yes, I'll do it, but they never do it, so you have to encourage them. Well, it took me a long time to develop a system for doing this. It was painful. I spent hours and hours of trying and testing and figuring out ways to get people to go through the full process of finding people and getting them to do the review. After 90 days, I had something that was now working. It wasn't working perfectly, but it was starting to work. But it had taken me maybe 50 hours of effort to do it. It was painful. I was losing potentially other immediate opportunities to get a simple review system going. But today, I'm happy to say, I don't do it. It's purely automated. I have one part-time assistant that, I hate to say how little she gets paid, but for basically for $10, I will have her spend all the effort necessary to get about 20 reviews in the system wow. and, and keep it going. That pain and the effort of 50 hours of time to develop that system has now yielded something that's now growing on its own. I don't ever have to touch it again. I monitor it. I watch it. I figure out ways to improve it, but it's running on its own. I could literally visit in Col visit you down in Columbia. We could freaking have a crazy four weeks together, and I'll come back. There will be more reviews in my system because it's that automated. That's a good pain. I'm doing that through all facets of my business, and we all need to do that. That sounds like a really good pain. I got to tell you, I'm somewhere in that funnel. I owe you a review. So right after this uh, this interview, I owe you a review on Amazon because I absolutely love it, and uh, it'd be my pleasure to review it. Just out of curiosity, are you able to share uh, as an example? I know it took you a while to get that process in place, but what are some of the activities that she does in order to to get reviews? Are you able to share any of that? Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I'll give you the system. Um, I'll give you the basics of the system. I'm actually going to write a blog post about it because okay. uh, now I have it. I, I'm so happy with it. I want to kind of get the word out. He, here's what I figured out. Uh, this is Amazon-based, but you can do it on any kind of review system, Yelp and so forth. I go to Amazon, and you have to have, of course, your product listed, a book. If you can sell washing machines. It doesn't make a difference. Go to your listing on Amazon. Then scroll down. I think I'm not in front of my uh, Amazon now, but I think it's about three-quarters of the way down the screen. It'll say customers have also bought products by, and then it lists, in the case of a book, all the other authors that they bought their books from. If you sell washing machines, it tells you competing brands they bought from. Well, the power in this is Amazon has a really amazing engine they've developed to assimilate information, and they are telling you what your customer, someone visiting your website, what they end up actually buying. It may not be your product. So step two is now that you know this, go to that other product, the other author of another book. I then go to that author's reviews, and so another author may have 50 reviews. You then go into each reviewer, 
and it shows a profile. I say about 10% of the time, the profile includes the person's email address. Other times it has a LinkedIn or some other way of contacting them. And sometimes you do a little sleuthing and you can find them on the web very quickly. Of those 50 reviews for other author, I will find the contact information for maybe 25 of them very quickly. Then I have a template email I send out to him saying, hey, I saw that you read this book by this author. I'm so happy you like it. I wrote a similar book. It would be my honor to send you my book uh, in, in consideration of reviewing it. And, and it's a very soft sell. I say, if you don't want to review it, I get it. It would just be a privilege to send you my book. People acknowledge. I send them the book. And now I follow up with them and they do the review. Surprise, surprise, most of the time it's a five-star review because they're so excited to be getting your book in the first place. The power of their review for the customer's perspective, when they see it, it's another review. When they, when they, if they decide to dig into that person, they see that's legit because they're reading complimentary books. So it's the perfect review. So that's the basic set. That, that, that's fantastic. I absolutely love it. I'm, I want to sit here and clap for you creating that process right here. <laughs> yeah. So why, how and why is it worth uh, you paying postage, you paying for the book in exchange for the review? Right. Right, so, so I have to send them the book. There's a little cost associated with that. You know, books, there, there's no magic behind it. A hardcover book only costs about $3 to print. Mailing, packaging, maybe $5. It's maybe $8 in, in the cost. But the power of that review, one review, every additional review, it may sell another 20, 30 books. Now, a book retails for almost $20. That brings in some real money to me. Wow. Uh, and it, it continues the ongoing momentum. It's a big deal. There's one other trick, too. Amazon has what they call the um, verified purchase. So if someone does a review and may say verified purchase, you can gift your book to the person too. So if you have a reviewer, uh, you can say, hey, I'm going to gift you the book. They get it through Amazon. You have to purchase it yourself through Amazon. They get it. And now when they do the review, it comes up as a verified purchase. So you can do that too if you want. It costs a little bit more, but in certain circumstances, you may want that for additional credibility. Wow. Mike, there's so many things I love about you and, and love about the pumpkin plan. And uh, for those of you that are going to pick up the pumpkin plan, he does give you a, another website with even more resources. You know, you're always giving. You, you, one of your immutable laws is give to give. You know, uh, I've known you to give away many copies of your book uh, prior. Uh, for the people who purchase the pumpkin plan, inside there's a website. It's the pumpkin plan something or other. You're going to have to read the book in order to get all the resources. But you're just giving more and giving more and giving more. Mike, I know you're super busy and you've got a lot going on. You're coaching a lot of businesses. You're doing interviews like this. You're hanging out with your family and, and doing all the things that Mike McCallis does. And watching a lot of football. Watching a lot of football and drinking a lot of beer and, <laughs> Love beer. and spending time with your family. Uh, the book is The Pumpkin Plan. We're going to have a link below right here. It's going to go directly to Amazon. Don't only order the book. Don't only read the book, but review the book for Mike. I rank it up there just as impactful, if not more, as The E-Myth by Michael Gerber. To me, it was absolutely uh, perfect timing as I'm growing my outsourcing business and learning what I should be doing and shouldn't be doing and getting rid of some clients and niching more and raising my prices. It's been fantastic for me. Is there anything else that you think that the people who have tuned in this far, who've watched this far, who are about to purchase the book, anything else that they should know about you, about the pumpkin plan, anything else you want to share, Mike? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'd like to share one final thing is what we just talked about, I think, is going to scare a lot of people, Lewis. Not, not scare them like, oh my God, the heebie jeebies, but saying, you know, I get the concept, but it's too risky for me. Most of us feel more comfortable in staying status quo. It's like a relationship. You know, you, someone gets into a relationship and a bad relationship, and they never break off the relationship. And everyone on the outside is like, are, are you kidding me? How can you be with that? But there, there's a lot of comfort being in something that we're comfortable with, something that we know. And making a change is actually more frightening. Even if we know logically it's better, it's still frightening. So what I found, Lewis, is a lot of people hear the concept of the book, they read the book, and then they're like, you know, I'm just going to keep doing it the way I've always done it. You know? So here's the key. You can turn fear on itself. And here's what I suggest you do. This is what my, my own business coach did to me and scared the crap out of me and made me change and start pumpkin playing my business. He said to me, where I am today and where you are today, where we all are today, is a result of the decisions and actions we've taken over the last five years. So where we are today, obviously, is a result of that. Therefore, five years from today, if we continue to make the same decisions, take the same actions, we'll be in the same spot. And you can continue this pattern all the way to your grave. 
And he said, you're going to be on your deathbed, Mike, and you're going to be regretting your life if you keep doing this. And when he said that, he scared the shit out of me. I mean, it really scared me. I was like, oh, my God. He tr- and I said, I asked him, I said, why, why ultimately did you do that? He says, if I can scare you of where you're headed by continuing this pattern, I can get you to take the leap to try something new. So I encourage everyone watching this video right now, yes, read the pumpkin plan. Yes, totally like understand it. But most importantly, get really terrified of continuing to be stuck where you are. Once you're afraid of that enough, you'll have the courage to go to something a little bit less scary, and that's pumpkin planning your business. Absolutely. And I'll tell you, it certainly has been shifting my paradigm a little bit. It's, it's almost like the one nut guy, right? It's the one, yeah, that's the one nut guy. That's the, for me, that's the manifestation. If I continue to go in the same pattern that wasn't working, I would end up in a rusty lawn chair with one nut swinging out of my shore. Not a pretty sight. <laughs> If you want to know what we're talking about with the one nut guy, you've got to read the pumpkin plan. Mr. Mike McCallowitz, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Everybody out there, thank you for joining us. Don't only pick up the book, The Pumpkin Plan, but read it and implement it. You're going to be happy that you did. So Mr. McCallowitz, thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Take care, my brother. Take care, everybody.